saying no is the worst part of the job. Best part of the job is just meeting an incredible array of incredibly talented people who have vision about what the future could look like and getting you know the the sneak peek of what that could be. It's it's very exciting. Ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Emily Briggs, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm pre I appreciate you uh, being here. Um, so you are a principal at Georgian Partners, raise $1.2 billion across four funds. Can't say if there's more to come, but that's what people do is they raise money. Um, what has been your journey to get to the point where you're now writing checks and investing in, in technology companies? Sure, so I think across the investing landscape, people have very different paths. They're, they're, you often talk to investors and you'll find they come from really different, bizarre backgrounds, sort yeah. of backgrounds. Um, mine, I think, falls in that line. Um, so I actually did my undergrad in dance. I trained my whole life to be a professional ballet dancer. Juilliard? Uh, yeah, went to Juilliard. Um, spent four years there. Uh, it was an incredible experience. Um, made lifelong friends. Uh, Graduated, was freelancing in New York, um, realized that, you know, my career, uh, sort of the pinnacle you can get to in that career is, is some of my teachers at Juilliard who I look to and, and just see that how hard their lives were, um, you know, in their 40s and 50s, um, you know, struggling to, to make ends meet in some cases and realized that I wanted sort of a broader uh, career. And I, I had the opportunity to join a nonprofit that had been started by two colleagues from Juilliard as the first full time employee. I ended up running that for about four years uh, in New York. We did arts accessibility work. So we worked in schools, hospitals and communities, um, bringing professional artists to work with um, folks need yeah. and um, learned a lot of like hard business lessons during that time. It was, uh, you know, had, had very little kind of formal Nonprofits is probably education. like the hardest. I mean, it's super hard. Yeah. Um, so raising money, uh, finding people that want to work for significantly less than they could get paid totally. elsewhere. Um, you need a really strong vision and a really and strong kind ability of ability to driving sell and, motivation. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, you know, I, I, the, the education at Juilliard was amazing, but I literally danced for 12 hours a day, six days a week. And then you're week. running this part time? Um, so once I transitioned okay. to um, this kind of full time, it was maybe three, four years after undergrad. Wow. Uh, so yeah, learned a lot of really good lessons during that time, um, but realized I just had no formal education on the subject of business at all. Yeah. Uh, all of my lessons were learned um, the hard way. Yeah. And so I ended up going back doing my MBA at yeah. Cornell, um, went to McKinsey afterwards for a couple of years. And what was then that like? Because I seen that, I yeah. forget the name of the show about like these, um, I mean, they live on a plane. They, they <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, sun, I think it's like Sunday night, Thursday, you know, yeah. and a lot of entertaining, a lot of uh, modeling. Uh -huh. Like, is it that? No, like, no. It's, okay, it's sitting it in a, as a dark, a dark conference room in yeah. some forgotten windowless part of a, a client's America building. Somewhere. Exactly. Um, you know, I think we we got to work on some really interesting problems, yeah. um, and actually some things that ended up being super relevant to the work I do today. at Georgian. Um, yeah. Working with a lot of banks and insurance companies, going through digital transformation, figuring out, you know, uh, how do I adopt new technology, but also how do I change the way my team works? How do I put new KPIs in place? How do I hire entirely new types of roles that I've never had I, before? I guess, I guess as an entrepreneur, I've always, when I think of management consulting or the McKenzie or whatever it is, mm -hmm. I just can't, I can't see like, would these companies want you there? Or, you know what I mean? Like, I just, I'm like, why would I pay so much money for somebody telling me something that I probably know I need to do, but is it the yeah. data set they're looking for? Or did they really not know what direction they should go? Yeah. So sometimes, um, you know, I would say, I would say more often than not, the solution is known. The direction they want to go is known. Yeah. Um, they're looking for external validation and also the experience of a group that's maybe done it before and can help oh, with so some best practices. The fact that you come with expertise in finance or banking. Exactly. And, um, and they know you probably worked with their competitor. So maybe you guys got some stuff, but you know, there's exactly. a Chinese wall. Right. Exactly. I mean, I think, I think, you know, banks are adopting new tools, new ways of working mm. and 
that's uncharted territory for, for many of them. And I think that bringing in a McKinsey or a BCG or a Bain is one way to kind of guard against the potential pitfalls um, of going down a very new path. Yeah. And I think, again, relevant to the work I do now at Georgian, um, you asked, you know, uh, do they want you there? I think we often worked in embedded teams. So you'd be going into a team from a bank, a uh, team from McKinsey working side by side. Okay. And I think there is that inherent tension of, you know, do they want us there? Maybe not everybody. Um, and you really have to um, work together and lead through influence. And I think that's a very similar thing to working with portfolio companies. Totally. Post-investment, it's, you know, we're not majority investors. We don't come in and, and bring in, you know, you this is the way yeah. things are going to be. Yeah. Um, we're minority investors. And so everything we do has to be through influence and it has to be through kind of establishing a shared vision and getting people on board and we're all working towards the same goals. And, um, you know, that that was a really good lesson actually learned. At, learned That's at interesting. Yeah. Instead of just the influence side of how do we how do we present something where they kind of come to that conclusion without feeling like we told them exactly to do it. Right. What did you um, what were some of the lessons learned in, you know, learning to dance that you <laughs> actually brought to the business world? Yeah, um, it's a that's a good question. It's actually something I've thought more about well, as a mastery, gotten right? Like later I mean, in my anybody career. that's like great musicians or any artists. A lot of programmers I know are really great. Yeah. You know, they have other areas they've mastered, and I'm just curious what translated for you. Yeah, I, I think some of the things that I've appreciated more as I've gotten older. Um, I think when I started out in my career, I was like, oh, I'm missing all of, you know my business career. I'm missing all these things. I, I don't know all these hard skills. Now I've I've really started reflecting on what do I know um, through all of those years of, you know, a very kind of high discipline environment. Um, you know, and I think, I think grit is the, you know, Huge. one of, one of the, the big things. And I think um, just the ability to go in day after day and, and really push towards something. I think with dance, it's, you know, you go to these auditions with 800 people in the room and your number like 757 and you might get told no, you know, 30 times in a row before you get told yes. And I think that that level of kind of just drive and determination and, and doing it just because you want to and with very little hope for other rewards else, yeah. is I think a really um, good lesson that I learned. And I think um, it's a very kind of long-term view that you have to have about your career and why you're doing what you're doing. And that really translates over into the investment world. I mean, we're in a very long-term business. It's a, it's a tough business. It's a competitive business. Um, and I think those lessons have, uh, they've kind of illuminated themselves to me over time and I've appreciated them a lot more. That um, you went through that experience. Old, older, yeah. Gives you context. Yeah. Um, cause it's, it's fascinating. I remember, I mean, a long time ago, it, it occurred to me that investors are, you know, they're entrepreneurs. They got to go raise money. They mm -hmm. have LPs. Uh, it actually made it because like there's always this like, you know, if you don't know any better, you're just like, oh, there's these people that want to take a piece of my company for money and not do any work. <laughs> and I'm doing all the work. And yeah. um, but, you know, once you realize that they have to do a lot of the hard stuff that founders do, mm -hmm. um, it it, um, it creates more of a, I guess, a shared journey. Um, your experience so far, uh, I know you've led a few deals. You mm -hmm. help with board governance. Um, what have you learned about like the influence side, what you just mentioned um, in regards to um, relationships with, you know, CEOs and, and are most of the yeah. companies you guys are involved in, is it still the founder running these or is it? It's a mix. Um, yeah. It often is. Um, uh, sometimes we're coming into, you know, a CEO has taken over from an original founding team, but often okay. we're working with the founding and you, team. And you don't do majority in regards to control, but do you lead rounds? We do. Yeah. Okay. We're usually coming in as the lead. And more growth um, stage. Growth stage. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're coming in kind of 10 to 20 million of revenue north of 6 million of ARR is our sort yeah. of threshold. That's the lower end, um, 6 million plus. Exactly. Yeah. And what's um, the size of the investments typically? So generally, uh, kind of 20 to 40 million. Um, yeah. Sometimes we'll go a little bit higher, um, but 20 is sort of the, the low ends. And then we're leading the rounds. Um, and I think to, to answer your question on, uh, you know, how do you think about influence? I think they're... Um, you know, founders have the toughest job in the world. It's incredibly hard running a company. And mm -hmm. I think um, 
bringing something authentic and real as an investor is really important and always doing what you say you will do. Um, so we, uh, Georgian has um, set ourselves up very much like a software company. We have uh, an in-house R&D team. We have an in-house customer success team and operations team. Wow, you call it that. Um, yeah, we do actually. Nice job. Um, so we've, we've very much like taken the mindset of we're going to model ourselves after one of our companies. And actually we've been on our own growth trajectory when I joined four years ago or so. We were 17 people. People. We're almost 60, 60 now. Yeah. So we've really thought carefully about how do we build this company to, to resonate with the companies that we in, invest in. Yeah. Um, and from a you know value add perspective, um, when we go in and, and we say we can, you know, we think we can help you in these areas, I think living up to that is is something we think about all the time is how do you live up to those early discussions and make sure that you're, you know, that trust, that that ability what to influence. What you said you would do. Exactly. It's, Bef yeah. Exactly. It's it. You know, the ability to influence is predicated on trust, and I think trust comes with um, being authentic and living up to your but, word. And and you said that that mm -hmm. was two things: authentic and um, say do what you're going to say. Yeah. How does the authentic part? Because that's what I find really fascinating, Emily. When I've seen other interviews of you online, mm -hmm. is um, you know, and I think your your creative background, um, you're you're very honest about who you are, and this is you know my journey. And I think that's what, and, and obviously the McKenzie experience, I'm assuming, you know, trying to go to like mid, middle America and try to connect with these people that may, you know, like, is it that you, you, you're more transparent and honest? How do you build that trust quickly? Like how does, tr if some if a founder wants to do this, what are some of the approaches that they could do that you've, you found work really well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is hard. Is how do you, how do you establish that relationship in a in an efficient way, in a quick way, right? Sometimes sometimes you're you're building a relationship in let's say a month, the six week diligence process. How do you do that? I mean, I think that um, you know one of the things we always encourage people that we're talking to to do is talk to other CEOs that we've worked with um, to hear their story. You know, call anyone in the portfolio, get their story about Georgia and about the people you've worked with there. Um, you know, that's important. I, I do, and I do think you know opening up. Cer certainly, there's things you can share, there's things you can't share in any context, um, but opening up and sharing what you can in a very kind of transparent and forthright way. And sometimes that's, this isn't a great investment for us. And, and here, let me explain to you exactly where where we invest and why and how I think you can, you know, further your business. Yeah. Um, let me provide you with some meaningful feedback and some help um, to get where you want to go, and even if it's that, not a fit Emily, because that's tough, right? It's very tough. It's I, as an, I've, I've invested in yeah. 40 companies and mm -hmm. I've always wanted to be not just a no, but a mm -hmm. no, and here's why. Yeah. Some people don't want to hear, but I just felt like, you know, how do you how do you how do you do that for founders? Yeah, and I think because we're late later stage, we we tend to have a fair bit of data to work with. So we've usually mm -hmm. done a lot of meaningful work um, by the time we get to a no. If we've we've gotten into a process with someone, we we often offer to share back that work, um, whether it's a financial really, model like we've full, built. Yeah. Um, you know, we won't we won't share. Let's say a return yeah. case, um, yeah. but we'll share. You know, here's What's a model a we built. Case? Uh, so that's our our internal case that Let says. Let us know the inside. <laughs> yeah, this is it. Like we're getting question. the good stuff. Um, yeah. So we build our own um, model internally to to validate whether or not. A, a potential investment will meet our return criteria. So we take a company, a company gives us a management plan. Yeah. We build a bottoms up view of that plan. Um, it's, I think, almost always lower than what the management thinks if we project out three or four years. Yeah. That so becomes kind of our like worst case or like. That's our kind of mid case. Like uh, this is our case, practical okay. reality, Georgian yeah. views we're going to get here in yeah. four years. And yeah. that case needs to meet kind of our return yeah. threshold. And then uh, our low case would be, you know, this thing really just doesn't take off. We yeah. end up in a bad place, um, really much Acceptable lower growth. Acceptable risk, like you're evaluating exactly. the risk levels. And so we, we look across all these three cases and we kind of get to a, a view. Return of case. Where we, where is we there a standard norm for investments? Like, is this an, uh, like a, an investing kind of thing that people know? Like McKenzie, do they do this for companies? Um, I don't know if they do it. Like, in the do you, same like way. is Georgian have like an IP around that? No. Okay. I, our peers were all doing very okay. similar things. Got um, it. Like in the growth stage, I think it's pretty. And common the inputs are model. traditional inputs, or do you guys look at like geopolitical stuff? Like, what are you looking at as inputs on? Yeah. 
We so we we do look at market risk um, really carefully. So we have kind of a separate market process that we go through. Um, on the financial case, we do a very kind of in-depth granular buildup on every lever of the business. So um, you know that looks at reps that you have, how fast you're going to hire people, how fast are they going to churn out of the business, what are their quotas, what's attainment been previously. You can go. I can go on and on. Um, yeah, no, I'm but curious. they're very yeah. very detailed kind yeah. of builds. Um, and then if we're looking at let's say a model that's more in the SMB space, we might look at um, kind of macro view of products, how yeah. those um, those sales cycles have worked over time, what are the, what is the impact of churn been over time, how do we project that forward? How much data are you buying like to to, to create mm -hmm. these models? Mm -hmm. Like is I'm assuming you guys have like other companies that provide data feeds for this or how to This is actually we do um, every company we we get kind of deep into a cycle with. Yeah. We do it. Oh you're learning up. too. Exactly. Ah. Yeah. So we do it bottoms up for, for every company. Um, okay. And sometimes we will we will look at benchmarks. So we'll, yeah. we'll benchmark a potential investment to the top quartile of our portfolio, for example. But is there like companies that sell this kind of like industry data? Like are there brokers, data brokers for... I feel like in the um, in the market investing, like high high frequency trading, like mm -hmm. there's all these different data sources. But is there like for VCs or private equity or growth stage equity? Is there um, companies? Because like as a founder, it sounds mm -hmm. fascinating. Like maybe I should do this for my own planning. Right, right. right. I, I think it is a good exercise for companies to go through. So we'll often we we won't share kind of the ultimate output. Yeah. But what we will share is the bottom up build that we yeah, do if we the feel like it. Process. Exactly. Yeah. And and we'll share that back to people. And you know, yeah. hopefully maybe they find value, maybe they don't. But yeah. at least it's shows the, the, the kind of you're, you're of thought showing them it. here's if you especially if you say no these are the reasons we don't think it, exactly it's going to fit for our return and it's not bad because i mean there's also like the fund age so like i know as founders mm -hmm. if you if you raise from a later stage fund then they've got to you know there's always the, the they've got to do a return so there's sometimes pressure at the board level like these are things that first time founders probably don't know that well mm -hmm. um i find that really fascinating yeah, we put a we we put a lot of thought into it, and we do try and share back as much as we can to the companies we talk to. Um, to to go back to your your question of like we, we really do try and show value, um, mm -hmm. even if the answer is no. Um, we we try and be a process that a founder looks back and says, oh, like they said no, but I learned something. Yeah, um, and it and, wasn't a no, and I don't know why it right. was. And um, when's the last time you don't have to give me the the case that somebody passed on you guys you wanted to do the deal and they didn't do it how'd that feel like that you were yeah. like meaningfully involved maybe you created this whole like whatever plan back thing or um how does that feel how do you deal with it's that? really tough when when you you know you you don't get a deal that you really want um we spend a lot of time uh thinking about those deals where did we miss how long where does that we process last the you retrospective guys, yeah. no the um the diligence process yeah usually so do you have a full Honestly, process after if you don't get a deal to re the retrospective? Do you have? We haven't formalized it, but we okay. Do it sounded think like very formal, real it. quick. We it's do like, think yeah. a lot about. It. We talk a lot about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, There's so a feedback loop into what can we do next time to make sure this doesn't happen. Exactly, and we we've you know over time made a lot of changes to our process. Yeah. Um, when we have reflected on things that we really wanted and and didn't end up getting. Yeah. Um, and usually it's you know usually it goes back to not understanding the motivations. Mm -hmm. Um. So we spend a lot of time trying to understand right up front when we start talking to founders, what does an ideal partner look like for you in this round? What, who's going to make the most impact on your business? Yeah. Um, who do you want to bring in? And sometimes and you're asking the CEO that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So usually now every call, first call we do with a company, we'll ask, who's your ideal partner? What do you what do you want to get out of a partner in okay. this round? Because um, if you know that's not the characteristic of what you guys can do you will just bow out or you want to make sure you present it? I, I think, you know, sometimes the answer is it, it may just not be the right fit. I think more often than not, whether or not it's exactly what we're thinking we bring to the table, there's enough information there that we can adjust how we communicate in our process. Yeah. Um, and present those aspects of what we do, because um, we have a pretty broad offering across Georgia at this yeah. point, um, in the best light to answer that kind of need or concern of Got the founder. It. So it's really just about like, if you go to a proposal, like 
you need to make sure that you address the things that they're asking. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Right. Sales. Like it's sales, yeah, yeah. right? It is 100% it, sales. It's 100% sales. Um, yeah. And it's a competitive industry. And so I think thinking along those lines has has become something that's very much ingrained in, in our team. How do you guys look at differentiation? Like, what's the unique things that you guys have decided to tell the market about yep. Georgian? Yeah, so our kind of core differentiator and how we were always um, set up very right from the beginning 11 years ago when Georgian got started is that we would have what we call our impact team. Um, and this is basically an applied research lab at, in-house at Georgian. So okay. we have a group of machine learning uh, researchers, engineers, data scientists, NLP folks, cybersecurity folks on staff what? at Georgian. Um, and they work with our portfolio. So that's... Really? Yeah. So that's really how we lead. Um, that's some value add right and there. And our, our differentiation. So w going back to the CEO, con we really look wh of where can we add value in product? Where can we add um, you know incremental uh, knowledge to your organization to help your R&D team move faster? Mm. Um, so they may not have the internal resources to do the analysis. Now I see where your background from McKenzie really can be the, like a differentiator because you already know how to crunch the data or what to look for or how to bring that up. Because most founders are too busy thinking about the future to actually even optimize the stuff they're doing. And there could be some like crazy low hanging fruit. Yeah. And, and we'll often see that with companies that have amassed a really valuable data asset. Yeah. And maybe haven't monetized it yet. Yeah. And there's incredible insight to be kind of un unlocked from that. And yeah. so in those cases, when we, we invest in that type of company, we'll often help them uh, identify what those insights would look like, build up a data science team, and then maybe even do a dedicated research project where we'll come in for three to six months and help them build that first really? product module. Help them like hire, build out the, the, the product. Exactly. Man, um, that's really cool. Yeah. So that's, that's like really where we lean in um, with differentiation when we're talking to um, potential investments. Interesting. And are all fun, all four funds that you've raised so far um, had the same like uh, investment uh, characteristic or thesis? Yeah. So actually, our first um, two funds yeah. were all around the thesis area of applied analytics. Yeah. Um, so we got started in 2008. Um, big data was very much a, a new term yeah, in 2008. Sure. And, yeah. and the idea that you could draw out these insights from a business process, feed those insights back to consumers, they were going to find incremental value that they would pay for um, from those new insights, that was all very much emerging. And, and we really saw from 2008 to about 2014, 2015, that maturation happened where, you know, 2015, 2016, you're starting a business, you're not thinking about those things, you're, you're probably behind. At a disadvantage. Yeah. Um, and so that sort of was the maturation of applied analytics as our thesis area. We evolved applied analytics to what we now invest in, uh, which is applied AI. Yeah. Um, so increasingly using machine learning uh, technologies to unlock new insights, automate workflows. Um, Second one is conversational AI. So yeah. we look at messaging and voice-based interfaces, how you can personalize the customer experience mm. um, through new communication channels. And are you guys an um, investor in Chorus? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Such great. I mean, yeah, that's just, very, uh, it's next level. Yeah. Like this is, this is where people, you know, founders that are not using tools like this, they're a hundred percent at a disadvantage because the ability to work with your team to identify the, the bright spots amongst your sales right. reps, clip, add to a training database, onboard, train, all through automation around the voice level. I mean, it's right. like when, so if people, you guys can Google all this stuff, but um, when, do you, do you have companies that you've seen that are starting to do the conversation? Like at some point, because mm -hmm. there's enough data, the conversation might not be with a human. Right. It, like I could see that because I mean, mm -hmm. I train salespeople and like if they just do what I tell them to do, they usually get a fairly decent result. And it's a lot of it's question. Do you think there'll be a point where for maybe on the SMB or the support side, the conversation is being done with non-human Definitely. I think, I think we're seeing more and more of those kind of front end conversations, early conversations being automated by so the bot stuff bots. for sure right now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and they're getting smarter and smarter over time. And it's an interesting Nuance. space because you're, you're seeing this, um, you know, three kind of pillars. You're seeing the big companies like, like Microsoft getting into this, Salesforce, Einstein getting into this. Yeah. Um, you're seeing a really interesting cohort of kind of up and comer companies. Ada support in uh, Toronto is a really good example yeah. of a, a company in that space. And then you're seeing the in-house, the do it your 
yourself, right? So there's, there's frameworks like Rasa, which is a conversational AI uh, or uh, NLP framework uh, that companies can use to, to build their own. So um, it's interesting kind of seeing the, the three different kind of competing angles of how yeah, do we how approach. do we get this market um, where you can really automate a lot of that customer interaction. You can save a ton of money for, for companies running contact centers um, by deflecting a lot of these calls or answering a lot of these concerns uh, through an automated approach. Um, and it's also much better for consumers. It's faster. Um, it's way faster. And you're seeing interesting opportunities like, um, you know, generating revenue through those conversations. Like how do you hook into the back end systems in order to access the customer account so you can offer them the right products as you're, you know, working on changing their mailing address or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's a very interesting space. Uh, so I think we're seeing we're seeing more and more companies either going to market with a, a product around, um, you know, 100% kind of solving a, a problem in that space. We're yeah. also seeing companies that have a broader solution and are adding those kind of conversational capabilities up front. Do you think like in the future, maybe three or four years out, like AI is not like something unique to your business, but it's just like every business should have a team that specializes yeah. in insights from data or a hundred percent. Yeah. I like it's not, it, yeah. it's like saying I've got a database. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's, it's, it's yeah. going to be table stakes and yeah. we think. And, um, where do all these trained AI people come from? Like where are your portfolio? Like <laughs> the fact that you the have question. them on staff, I'm like, okay, that's not fair. Yeah. There's definitely a, a, a deficit of talent. Um, in if that somebody's area. trying to lean into that, what would your suggestion be if they wanted to have some somebody at least give them some counsel, some 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 thoughts around like auditing their their data sets and say like here's some opportunities? What you know for founders that are at like you know three to six million in yeah. ARR, yeah, I mean have I a clear value prop exactly, and that's the right approach by the, by the way. Like starting with get some advice, understand the data set because bringing on those resources are incredibly expensive. And if you don't have a really well scoped thing for them to work on and data that's in the right place, uh, often we'll say start with a data engineer um, first and make sure a you data have, engineer. have a really What would that strong, person do? So they would look across the data set that you have, they would organize it in the right way, they would think about what could be done with, with this data, um, they would make sure that it's in a in a kind of format and Do universities teach this data <laughs> engineering. That's yeah, like a yeah. thing that you can get. That it is. It is. Wow. Um, so we'll often say, you know, start with just understanding your data first before yeah. you bring in a data scientist, before you bring in, you know, heavy duty ML talent, yeah. um, really have a, a firm handle on the data, the structure of the data, um, and the ability of it to be used, uh, and an understanding. Put it in so, a format that could be digested or useful. Exactly. And, and, you know, go and find, maybe it's at a local university, um, you know, a computer science team there can help you get an understanding of the art of the possible. You know, do some consultative work with folks yeah. before you start hiring up a team, um, because if you don't know exactly how you're they're going to be deployed, it's cash. a ton of cash and um, and frustration on, yeah. on the part of the people that you hire. Yeah. Um, I just have a lot of people message me and they're like, "I need an AI expert." I'm like. <laughs> That's like such a broad question. It's right. like you you don't even know what you need to do, but you just think it's AI. Right. Um, and so, like, do you when you look at the landscape of opportunities where you guys are investing in, um, is is it is it just around like voice or applied AI? Is it um, what's the categories that AI seems to be? Um, in a B2B context, not consumer, yep. right? Because we have self-driving cars and all that stuff coming online. But like, what are the use cases from a business point of view that you feel are um, low-hanging fruit, you know, the next year to three years out? Right. Um, so we're seeing a lot of interesting applications um, in companies that are selling into banks, insurance companies. They have Fintech, very high yeah. value data. Um, they have a ton of it too. A ton of data, very high value data. Um, so we're seeing a lot of interesting companies there. Um, one of our newest investments is in uh, the real estate space. PropTech. Uh, PropTech. New company. word. I just learned it, Emily. Thank you for teaching it to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, a company called Reonomy, which is based in New York. Uh, and they're in the commercial real estate field, which is a, a an industry that historically has been, had very analog, very messy data. Yeah. Um, and we're kind of coming into a world with the introduction of all of these um, different ways to, to manipulate and, and read data and ingest data, um, where a lot of that offline data is now being able to be digitized and yeah. you can do really interesting things with it. So that's a, a space we're excited about. Have as you well. seen what's the company? Um, 
SoftBank invested in in the real estate that essentially buys houses. Did you see this? Zol- is it XO? What's it called? Yes, I know what you're talking um, about. Keith Raboy was an early yeah. co-founder. I mean, here's a company. I mean, billions of dollars now deployed yeah. as, as a debt fund, essentially, yeah. to buy homes. And they have a whole infrastructure to renovate, to then resell, guarantee the sale prices, right. guarantee the buying, all powered through machine learning and, and data sets. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is crazy. It's, yeah, it's a really interesting um, time. I think there's a lot of opportunity in prop tech. I think we, um, historically, were all SaaS uh, investments. Yeah. Um, we've broadened that scope a little bit. We have some businesses that are more transactional in nature in the portfolio Okay, now. success fees versus reoccurring. Exactly, yeah. 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 Which and, is a great, uh, more marketplace great model. pricing model. I mean, pure alignment, value metric. Right. The more success, the more... Revenue, right? Exactly, and we see um, some good examples in mar- of marketplaces. Um, yeah. We're investors in a company called Ritual, um, which is based out of Toronto. It's a, more of a marketplace model, yeah. transactional model. Um, but I will say we have we, we look for predictability, and I think there is a certain amount of um, kind of data points that we would need to see around a model like like we're talking about, where you know we're we're raising a huge debt fund to, to buy out these properties, and yeah. how does that model kind of mature and age scale. and play yeah. out? I think we'd need to see more examples of that being successful to to feel comfortable just from kind of our mandate of, of looking. But for I guess the way I I'm, like if I just look at like where the big opportunities are, it would be in industries that have been around long enough that have collected enough data to be able to do these these modeling activities right, right? so financials yep real estate um i've got to assume food right like yep. or agriculture logistics yeah um, uh, health I health, also, uh, health you know there's some really interesting stuff happening in the the health healthcare industry how neat is it in your role because i don't think people mm-hmm. realize this as an investor you're essentially seeing into the future it's very like on a cool. daily basis, yeah. probably right. As you meet with like CEOs, mm-hmm. they're showing you their roadmaps yep. that aren't public. Yeah, it's it's like best part of the you know saying no is the worst part of the job. Best part of the job is just meeting an incredible array of incredibly talented people who have vision about what the future could look like and getting you know the the sneak peek of what that could be. It's it's very exciting. Wow. And then how do you like from a Kind of just a personal development mm-hmm. point of view, Emily. I'm just curious, like, how do you and um, what books do you read? What mm-hmm. what do you do to better your skill set? To I mean, be a better investor, board mm-hmm. member, partner. Yeah, so I read a I read a fair bit. I'm actually reading a book called Multipliers right now, which is it's more on the book. team side. Yeah. Um, yeah, but but read read a fair bit. Um, you know, read the blogs and the news posts and um, all of that. And and I think just talking to people and kind of when I when I find something I'm really excited about going deep and really understanding the um, what's happening in that industry and so that tends to be just driven by companies that I'm talking to at that particular time um, but you know we do have the the you know fortune of just being in the cross section of a really incredibly talented group of people so I spend a lot of time just talking and they're to on people your staff well. I mean if you if you need to go deep down a that's really cool yeah um, when you look back at like your journey. Um, and kind of like who you are today, what, like, who did you need to become to be successful? You know, mother, <laughs> investor, yeah. um, how, what, like kind of when you look back at the, the person dancing at Juilliard to today, what were some of those life lessons and, and how'd that impact your character? Yeah, that's a great, really good question. Um, I know you weren't expecting that. So, one, so. <laughs> that's the kind of question I like to ask. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that um, you know, dance is an interesting thing because it, it takes so much kind of drive and dedication and precision and all of those things, and you don't talk. Uh, you know, I, I basically spent the first Movement. twenty years of my life uh, communicating. Uh, physically and not through speech. Mm. Um, so there was this whole education process for me of how do I learn to communicate with people speaking mm. <laughs> and and the confidence to do that, right? And, and I think the confidence to, you know, a lot of our work, um, no matter how much you educate yourself, you're always learning something new by the people you talk to. And I think just the confidence that you can, um, you know, plug in and add value even when you may not, when something may be new. Um, you can still bring a valuable perspective. I think that that confidence, you know, took 
time to develop. I think the very first time I went into a, my very first finance class at like the age of 28 at Cornell, um, I, I was like crying afterwards. I was so scared and I was so, um, you know, just overwhelmed uh, by what I didn't know. Yeah. And I think it took time to just kind of realize that that's okay and that's a part of learning and that's a part of um you know being valuable is having that mindset that you're always open to learn but you can still kind of step up and communicate and bring value even when you may not know all the answers so so the building that confidence over the years of, yeah. of being okay with not knowing mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a better way to put it <laughs> no it's, it's it's interesting i think a lot of women are going to watch mm -hmm. this i know my wife um you know is as successful as she is she still has mm -hmm. these moments where she doesn't feel like uh, worthy or confident or, you know, and it's just fascinating, especially from my end, I'm sure, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, um, they're like, really, you're just, you should like, it's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know you do work with, I think it's girls in code or. Yeah. I kind of learn in code. Yeah. yeah. So how does that, like, where'd that passion come from? How does that impact your life today? And yeah. Um, so this was a, an organization. It used to be called Ladies Learning Code. Yeah. Um, they've they've changed to Canada Learning Code and um, have a mission of, of bringing technology experiences to 10 million Canadians over the next That's 10 awesome. years. That's um, a lot of Canadians. We're not a, a lot of Canadians. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they have programs now that are uh, focused on women, uh, focused on kids, uh, and then focused on kind of you know broader community. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we've been involved with them for the past five years or so as donors and and volunteers. So all the Georgian team volunteer one day a year for uh, Canada Learning Code programming. Um, and, you know, we feel very passionately about uh, technology education. I think to our it's earlier that, yeah. conversation around how do you develop the skill sets? Um, well, it can't all come from one part of the population because this is going to be almost every job is going to yeah, need to have some level of, yeah. of skill in, in technology. And so we need to reach broad and we need to touch a lot of people and, and get, uh, you know, these kinds of educational opportunities into the hands of everyone, um, no matter age or background or sex or, you know, any of those things. So um, that's, you know, the reason that the Georgian got behind Canada Learning Code. I think me coming from a nonprofit background, um, I was really excited when I joined the team to get involved. So I've been working with them for, for the past four years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, it's, it's incredibly gratifying to, to see that. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's a long gap for, you know, the nine year olds we volunteer with to, yeah. you know, founder of a, you know, series C company. But yeah. I think it's, it's exciting to think that there's a much broader spectrum, exposure. Exactly. Right? It's, it's really cool. And it's, you know, going to those classes and seeing, you know, every race, every gender, every, you know, all this whole cross section of the population, um, learning how to interact with technology is so exciting for what this, you know, what this industry looks like in 20 years. And if somebody's interested in reaching out to chat about investments, yeah. you know, career paths, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. where do the people find you online? Um, so I have a Twitter account. I'm, I wish I was better at it. Um, my email is, is always good. You all yeah. should uh, partners.com uh, cool. and LinkedIn. Yeah. All right. LinkedIn email. Emily, I appreciate you coming on the show. All right. Thanks, Thanks so, so much. much. Cheers. Thanks for watching this episode of Escape Velocity. Be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment with your biggest insight from our conversation. Be sure to check out the next episode.